Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for, for having me. Um, it's really an honor to be here. I've long, long been an admirer of the studio school, um, of Graham Nixon's work, of David Cohen's writing, and I've always wanted to do a drawing marathon. So it's, it's really exciting for me to be here. Um, and I'm going to try to work this slideshow, but I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, let's see. Okay. So I thought I'd... Thank you. I thought I'd start with um, speaking a little bit about my background um, in terms of education. And for me, the, the most interesting part of artist talks is always in sort of making the connections, how they've gotten to point A to point B. Um, so I thought I'd kind of give a chronology of, of the work as well as um, education and experience. Um, so I was, I was born in, in Austin, Texas and grew up in Dallas, which was frankly a terrible place to grow up, especially for a young artist. Um, I started to study nude figure drawing from life, uh, drawing from the model, uh, twice a week when I was 12, and I had to go with my mom because I was so young, and uh, it was the two of us and five 50-year-old women in uh, this sort of hippie's garage, um, painting and drawing the nude model. Um, and so I did that all throughout high school and I would, I would come back to school and put up my drawings, uh, very kind of academic figure drawings, and um, actually almost got kicked out of high school for doing this. The director of the school finally compromised and said I could put up nude figure drawings of women and nude self-portraits were fine too, but no men were allowed because that was considered pornographic and even up until high school they would not allow me into the honor society because because they told me I had no honor, because I was some kind of pornographic pervert for doing these drawings. Uh, so I luckily had a very supportive mother, and when I was 17, she got the idea to ship me off to London for the summer, and uh, heard it was a good painting school, and so I went. And it was sort of my first real art experience. Um, I went to the Slade, which is UCL's uh, drawing and painting school, with an incredible lineage of artists like Stanley Spencer, Lucian Freud, Paul Arrigo. And it was the first time I really encountered art as a serious discipline. Um, and I was taking a figure drawing class. I wasn't painting at the time. And we would come in, and it was very rigorous. Um, you, you had to be there on time, no cell phones. You had to be ready. You, you took very few breaks, and it, you worked with natural light. Um, <clears throat> And uh, it was it was really really inspiring, very very tough. Um, and I decided to go back again when I was 19, and I felt I was ready to start to discover painting. So this was really where um, I think I I sort of learned how to paint. I had a wonderful tutor, and still use the same palette as the the Slade palette. Started to work on a wood palette, um, which is now a huge rolling table made of wood. Um, but, but this was the first time that I, I started to paint in oil and also started to look at artists like Cezanne and um, many of the figurative artists who had come out of the school who I'd never seen before. My education in, in the garage was uh, mostly focused around the old masters. So at this time I was uh, starting my degree at Yale, an undergraduate um, fine arts BA, and was very lucky to have um, some really sort of wonderful mentors along the way. And the head of my um, my master, the head of the residential college I was in, who was a chemical engineer, just loved the arts. And so every summer he would give me money and say, go wherever you want, go study art, go explore a new country, go paint, come back and have a show. 
So I went to the Slade my first summer um, to paint, and then the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and the Florence Academy the next two summers, which were both fascinating in sort of teaching very different traditions. Um, and in Florence, it was my first introduction to real academic work. And I've spent the first month drawing from casts, um, and then moved on to painting in grisaille, and then moved on to very rigorous um, painting classes with the female nude um, to the point that I found myself in the Boboli Gardens filling in the background of Ariadne and uh, Bacchus and, and realized that um, sort of at that point that I wanted something more than likeness in art and it was the really the first time I started to think about art being more than a representation of life or of what you see in front of you um, and in uh, Paris was incredible for its introduction to light and color that was completely different than what I had seen in Italy. Um, so I graduated from Yale in 2002 with my BA in, in uh, painting in fine arts and moved to New York and I had no idea what I was supposed to do. I had no idea what sort of being an artist was about or how I went on about that path. And uh, my master referred me to someone who was working um, for the curator of modern art at the Metropolitan Museum. So I sent in my resume, and somehow I was chosen as her assistant. So I moved to New York and started to work for her. And it was a really, it was a fascinating year. I got to see having no knowledge of the art world at this time, I was kind of thrown into the middle of um, sort of the other side of the art world, the museum side of the art world, and some some parts of it were fascinating. I, I got to work on some exhibitions with Chuck Close and um, Philip Gustin and Roy Lichtenstein, and then, you know, part of the time I was cleaning out her ashtray, but it was, um, it was a real, real education, and I met a lot of phenomenal people. Um, writers and curators and artists and such, and spent the year working by day and then coming home and painting in my apartment at night, doing these large six by eight foot um, figurative paintings, uh, self-portraits, myself in very theatrical designed interiors. Uh, I was looking a lot at fashion photography, Eric Fischel, um, various contemporary figurative painters, but really was in increasingly frustrated at having no time to pursue my own work. And so I decided when the year was finishing that I would apply for a Fulbright. And I decided I would go anywhere in the world if someone else would just kind of pay for me to go and paint for a year and be as far away from New York as possible. Of course, that's not what I told them. Um, I, was, I, was, I went to Oslo to study Edvard Munch, and they have the largest collection of his work in the Munch Museum in the National Gallery. And I was a student at the Staten's Kunst Academy, which is the National Academy. Um, and I had this wonderful studio overlooking the river um, with two hours of day sunlight and just worked for an entire year and was basically left alone. Um, and it was, a, it was a tremendous year in terms of growth and painting. It was probably one of the most difficult experiences I've ever had. Um, and made a large body of work um, of which this is the beginning, these paintings. Uh, a few of them survive. I tend to destroy a lot of my work. Um, and so with this body of work, I applied to Columbia when I came back to the US. So I'll start to show these paintings. And generally, all of the figures are life-sized. And they're all oil on canvas or linen, unless they're drawing. And I forgot to say, if anyone has questions while I'm going or comments or what have you, just please interrupt me. 
So I was looking at, um, I've, I've always been drawn to Piero, Della Francesca, Masaccio, um, Uccello, um, Velasquez. I was looking at Renaissance altarpieces um, for this painting. And I was using live models. And this was the last time that I would use live models. When I got to Columbia and had my nervous breakdown my first year of grad school, I stopped using live models. So. I may need some technical help. No. Oh. Okay. It's on. It's on my screen. It's on my screen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so these were these were the paintings from the year and also. I was using a lot of um I was very interested in the combination of the figurative and the decorative, looking at kind of the change between Giotto and Masaccio, um and really that kind of medieval use of the intense combination of the figurative and the decorative. Okay, I don't know. Um, so this is one of, I guess, the only remaining paintings from my first year at Columbia. Uh, Columbia was a really amazing experience. Um, I'd be curious to hear your sort of um, reflections on, on graduate school or um, sort of secondary school. Um, it was the first time I was in, w in with a group of people uh, where it was really mixed in terms of media. Um, and I was learning a tremendous amount. I was reading theory. I had really diverse studio visits. My mind was kind of being um, shaken up and um, on a daily basis. And I stopped painting the figure for a while and stopped painting from life um, and started to make these very carnivalesque, um, color-rich pictures. And I was still looking at fashion photography and but began to think more about translating the sort of literature I was reading into form. I was re reading a lot of like Borges and um, Allende and Sabato and a lot of the magic realists. So I was trying to make these kind of compilations of strange worlds. Um, and then these these started, and this was a really big sort of breakthrough for me. Um, I had never made drawings before, and I think it's because I had an uh, academic background of sorts that I was I had always been taught and always thought to um, make art about the figure in front of me. I never really trusted my imagination in terms of um, drawing from myself and not drawing from external sources. So I started to do these drawings which are gouache and chalk pastel on paper, about one, two feet. Um, very abstract thinking about Beckman and Nolda. And, um, I've always, I guess, had two sides to myself and my work, one of which is very focused on the representational figure and making a figure that that's lifelike and, and talking about human situations, and the, the other that's, um, I guess, maybe the opposite, that's very fantastical um, and that comes from the imagination that's quite dark and that's um, about power. So uh, this was the first sort of large-scale painting I did. It's about nine by nine feet. Um, and I was thinking again about carnivals and processions and this kind of Velasquez Goya nightmarish landscape. And this painting became that painting. So I was kind of all constantly reworking the images I was making, trying to, I guess, seek out a, a medium between these two parts of uh, myself and my interests. 
This is called Ceremony. And I'll just flip through. There are, there are quite a few slides. I brought a lot of work from the past five years, so. Okay. Okay. So this was the beginning. Um, I could say a lot about my time at Columbia. It was it was really confusing. It was it was liberating. It was my first year was a tremendous struggle in sort of figuring out what I wanted to do, and I think shedding a lot of my um, academic background um, and and trying to find myself in there somehow. Um, so this was the beginning of a body of work that made my first show, which I had as I was finishing graduate school. I was looking still at fashion photography, and because I'd used myself so much in the past, I was sort of questioning my representations of women and how that reflected either on, on my self-identity, sexuality, or maybe that I, I wanted to speak about something greater than myself. So this was the painting. So these were all works from that show, Unveiling. And a lot of the surfaces, I started to, I guess, find the surface, which I still work on, which is um, primed canvas um, and then um, with rabbit skin glue and primed with an oil primer. And then I take a um, cake batter knife and put a very kind of thick, as thick as possible so it doesn't crack, a uh, layer of oil paint on top of the canvas. And you can see in the right, in the right, sort of mid part of the canvas, um, the texture that that gives. And I like the, the violence that it uh, sort of imparts onto the surface of the canvas. And a lot of the areas are left blank. Um, so part up by the window and up by the um, head in, in the plastic bag are left blank. But my idea was this is a, um, this is called the Leftover Girls, and it's a sort of brothel of types where prostitutes go when they haven't been chosen. It's called fake. And that's another brothel. And this is a painting called War. Um, this was, I guess, towards the end of graduate school. And I was starting to experiment much more with the surfaces of the paintings. I think part of the um, evolution away from my struggle with just drawing the figure, just painting the figure, my interest just in the figure, was also trying to expand the application of paint. So there are areas that are quite thin and washy and areas that are much more built up and juicy. This is called Converter. So these are from my thesis show. That was a massive, like 10, 11 foot wide painting. And this was the first, um, so after, first piece after, after graduate school. After school I moved to Bushwick where I have a studio and kind of set up shop and just started working. And I, I kind of, again, had no idea what I was doing. I just um, went at it, so. Uh, this was the first transsexual I had ever painted. Uh, there have been a, quite a few more since then. Um, but I wanted to make a, a portrait. I guess I, I still I enjoy making portraits of uncommon or untraditional subjects um, where people are sort of in between fitting in and not fitting in and in between sexualities and genders. So this was a sort of traditional portrait with the curtain swept to the side and the um, stuffed birds behind her. And she's sort of fingering her boa in, um, in um, disease, unease. And I was still trying to make, think of making large scale 
kind of contemporary history paintings. So this was, I guess, a gesture towards that. This is called When the Drums Roll and the Lovely Lady is Sawn in Half. Um, it's from Auden, who I was reading and thinking about this woman who was maybe part of some kind of traveling carnival or circus, but because she is revealing her sex, which sort of at the, at the bottom of the canvas, it's maybe ambiguous, but she's um, a transsexual. She's going to be led off to the hangman, hangman's noose, which is standing behind her, far in the distance. This is called Pact. It's a political pact that's being formed by these children who are dancing wildly in the, in the foreground. They're elders um, who are sort of ignorant in their rapture, while the children who are the sort of second disease generation dance. And I was thinking a lot about Katakolowicz's images of dancing um, peasants and madness. And then these were all studies for a large painting called Voila Les Americaines. And I wanted to make a large scale um, sort of theatrical history painting about what it meant to be an American. So the setting, the setting was on stage. Uh, there was a kind of Don Quixote-esque windmill going in the background, a uh, woman hanging f with a noose, and uh, people trying to reach into each other's pants, and sort of a dead woman out for inspection, and then the, the sort of marionette players were on the bottom dangling their kind of cruciform marionettes. This is a painting called Blindness. Um, I read Saramago's book of that title. And uh, my uncle is blind. My uncle is on, on the very right of the painting, sort of higher up. And uh, I've always wanted to make a painting about blindness. And I wanted the figures to be very confrontational, very aggressive, pushing up to the foreground of the picture, but unable to lock the gaze with the viewer since they can't they can't see. And in the back is this sort of healing um, scene that's occurring with more drapery that's kind of presenting the action. And it's a large painting. It's about 11 feet long. And that's my uncle, Robert. Um, and so the only sort of activity I still do from life are self-portraits. So these are some of them. Not a self-portrait. That's my uncle. So this is the beginning of the work for my uh, second show that was at Mitchell and Nash uh, last year. And in starting out, I tried to really focus on those two parts, those two sort of segments of interest, um, sort of more intimate domestic portraits, and then these grand theatrical historical narratives. So this was the first painting um, I started for the show, and that's how it ended up. It's nine by nine feet, and it's a. I was thinking of um, a town square where all the danger and the punishments are sort of meted out. Um, so there's a woman hanging and a gun and um, a sort of skeleton in the American closet. Um, my uncle appeared three times, much to the dis displeasure of my family. Um, the woman up in the left-hand corner is dancing with death, and she's being dragged out of the picture in the lower right-hand corner. This is the stammer. Um, I wanted to, to. I'm always trying to have women reclaim power in paintings, and um, so I wanted to strip her bare, make her an Olympia of sorts, um, 
and lay her down in direct gaze of the viewer. And in the background, well, it's ambiguous whether it's sort of a background or a mirror. I was thinking of that Velasquez, Christ in the House of Mary painting. Um, and the man is strangling the brunette, and the blonde woman is kind of looking on in, in sexual pleasure. It's called Ryan and Jeremy. And I, I felt that I never saw portraits of um, tenderness between two men. I saw pornography or um, lust a lot, but never something tender, so I wanted to do that. This is a sort of another contemporary altarpiece of sorts. Um, this was sort of in the midst of all the Iraq heated war, um, not that it's not heated now, but there was a, um, I guess the George Bush time, um, a cabal, I was thinking of the maybe religious right who's praying over this dead soldier who's just returned home from war, who's the figure down like dead Christ in that Montania painting, and they're trying to resurrect him, um, but it's completely a farce, and it's kind of all kitschy and grand and ironic, and Christ is rising from the background with an extra arm, like a Shiva figure, but he's kind of a cowboy as well, and there are life-size angels flanking the painting, one who's naughty and a negligee. This is called scherzo, and it's, um, it means a wild dance or a joke in Italian. And she is performing on stage. I thought of her in some kind of Greek tragic play. And she's just murdered her husband behind her, who's kind of being preyed upon by this um, cemetery of um, Muppet kind of uh, porcelain doll figures. This is a portrait of a burlesque dancer. And this is a portrait of a transsexual. I went to a wonderful club and spent the evening photographing transsexuals. Um, and this was, again, I wanted to make a sort of uncommon portrait. Um, and I wanted her looking down at the viewer in a very haughty way. And in this painting, I was thinking of the um, Camus, Camus Sartre story about um, hell and how we define hell as sort of being stuck in a room with other people and we can't blink for the rest of our lives. So she is, uh, this is called Where She Stops, and she's sort of fate, and she's deciding who's next going to be plucked out from their casket-like hole and who's going to die. And in the back is the sort of dunce who's being punished. And of course, hell involves cowboy hats for me. <laughs> so this was some of the work from the show um, in Zurich. And uh, I, 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 again, was trying to kind of fuse these um, portrait paintings and bring some theatricality into them while bringing some kind of humanism into the more theatrical paintings. So this is a painting called Manda. And uh, I never see images of kind of older women displaying their sex, so that's what I wanted to do. This is called Hanging. It's a little um, oil on board. and. At this point, I, I had never done small oil sketches before. Up until this point, the process was that I, I would look, um, I look at historical imagery and from imagination sit down and draw and do um, the chalk and, and gouache, um, chalk pastel and gouache sketches. And then I go out and photograph um, in the real world and find people to enact the narratives based on the sketches. And then I take another set of photographs 
else and do another set of drawings. And from there I started to do oil sketches and then from there charcoal drawings and from there oil paintings, but not gridding up or nothing formal, just kind of an idea. I think for me the um, the works on paper and the oil sketches allow me to really loosen up and that's something that I tr I've been trying to transmit into the paintings. So this was all a body of work. Two women sort of kissing on the battlefield with um, figures behind them being hung. This was a large scale um, chalk pastel and gouache drawing. It's about six, five by six feet. And it was a sort of playhouse of um, burlesque tendencies. And that's the artist sitting on the stairs. So this was a sketch for um, a large scale painting called The Czech Bride. Uh, I was reading Hannah Arendt's writings on power and terror and Eichmann in Jerusalem. And so the show was um, meant to be in Berlin. So I wanted to make an entire show about Eichmann in Jerusalem to really kind of needle the Germans. Um, and so all of the previous work was part of that and, and this as well. This was the oil sketch for the large painting and these are the works on paper. So that would be kind of the first work on paper from historical imagery and imagination. And then this would be sort of after I photographed in real life and lit, I would come back to do the second set of drawings. The charcoal drawing, it's about 10 feet long. And this was the final painting. And it follows a woman, um, the same woman, who is being photographed and documented in the left panel. And the central panel is having her neck broken with a hammer. And in the right panel is with her German officer boyfriend um, from behind in front of the tracks. And um, there's a detail in Eichmann that speaks about how any non-German woman who married a German man at this time had to be photographed and cataloged in the nude. And Eichmann, because he considered himself a real proponent of the Jews, despite being the architect of the Holocaust, um, allowed women to be photographed covered in a bathing suit. So this is this, I sort of made up the story of this woman who is the Czech bride and she's being documented above a mortuary table while a nurse kind of paints a symbol on the wall and behind her are bride's heads and the woman who's just been photographed is, ca is crawling from the left panel to the central panel and then the same nurse reappears and this kind of headless scarecrow man is executing her and in the right panel she's with her future husband in front of large plate glass window with tracks behind it. And it's about 11 feet, 6 by 11, 5 by 11 feet. And these are details. And then this, that's the end of that body of work. This is called On the Lawn, and um, I wanted to make a painting about a sort of orgy taking place in an outdoor church. So the woman upside down without pants on is reading the Book of Judgment. These are small oil sketches on board. And I was looking at the Abu Ghraib photographs and wanted to make a painting uh, that really kind of represented what went on there and that line between fetish and imagination and play acting and reality and brutality. So this is all the sort of more recent, um, I guess since the summer on work. Um, and this is a drawing for a lithograph that I did, my first print I did. And I was reading The Master and Margarita, um, Bulgakov's satire, and picked um, the scene of Satan's ball. So 
this is that. These are all that. Not this, though. This is, um, this is called painting. It's a small oil sketch, and that's the large, um, it's like five by seven foot oil on board painting. And this is the first time I'd done a um, painting on board instead of canvas, which I found its properties in some ways much more to my liking, being less absorbent and being able to take a thicker layer of the oil primer and also being much tougher. And I could um, take the palette knife and really dig into the wood. So these are small uh, works on panel, which go uh, belong with the larger uh, work on board. All images of women. A soldier, woman, and it's a large um, painting also on board. It's about mm, nine feet high, and it, this is painting. And I wanted to make a painting of a man painting images of women. So they're various types of his creation, uh, both threatening and alluring. So the next uh, group of work I'm going to show. I um, I just got back from Rwanda, uh, where I've been photographing women survivors of the genocide, and I felt sort of a few months back that I'd gotten to a point where I was making so much work about play acting and theatricality and um, perversity um, with myself in there somehow, but but that the work was not direct enough, and it that I it was I guess too narcissistic in a way um, and sort of not enough anymore for me to keep enacting all of these fantasies and power struggles and I wanted to start to do something real and starting started to start to sort of engage in real life and make work that possibly could have some impact or um, really direct narrative. Um, and so I started to, a friend told me to start reading about Rwanda who was living there and I started to read about it and was uh, sort of horrified and touched on many accounts but um, I had, ne I, I sort of knew the basic what you learn in high school or what you learn in college about what went on during the genocide in 94. Um, um, in, in a span of three months, 800,000 people were killed, um, but didn't, didn't really sort of understand all of the intricacies of the relationships of power of pre-colonial and post-colonial and um, what, what had gone on and the, and emblematic that it still goes on in Congo and Sudan and so many places in the world and um, I was just really drawn to Rwanda for a variety of reasons, um, one of which was reading the testimonies and oral histories of women survivors and because of, because Rwanda was is geno was genocide, and um, the specificity of what went on there was by far the most um, efficient and and um, sort of grand uh, type of genocide that's ever occurred. Uh, there are whole sort of gaps in society in terms of uh, people who are over the age of 45, you don't see walking around, and there's sort of generations of women left without men, and the dynamic between women and their daughters, oftentimes their daughters would not really be their daughters, but sort of makeshift families that resulted, was incredibly touching. Um, also my background, having family who survived the Holocaust, this was something I sort of grew up up hearing about um, and read Samantha Power's book on America in the Age of Genocide amongst others and just decided I, I wanted to go and, and photograph women in their homes and try to make an exhibition that would raise awareness um, here in the States and speak to these women's experiences.
So I'm gonna show a few photographs from this trip. So I spent, I've spent five weeks um, in Eastern Africa and spent days going into these women's homes all over the country, young, old, rural, in, um, in Kigali, the capital, um, women who were my age who were students at the university or older women. I managed to be able to interview um, two women who were over 70. And I was I was there working with a filmmaker who I'd gone to university with um, who has an NGO called Voices of Rwanda. That's the only it, that's the only group that's putting these survivors' testimonies on film and recording them for history. Um, and so he, all of the women that I photographed were women who had given their oral histories to him. Um, the oral histories I sat in on a few range from, um, you know, seven, eight hours to sometimes two days straight with no breaks. Um, and we're just... Uh, you know, words words can't describe what it was like there. So, this was. So that's the end. Thank you. Thank you.